Welcome back, everyone. You are in mitigation track F3, vulnerability and risk assessments. And first up on the schedule is Randy Bean. He is a non-structural mitigation specialist, among many other things. And he's with Beam Hazard Mitigation, LLC. And his presentation today is titled, Saving Our Historic Building Stock Through the Application of Non-Structural Mitigation. Randy? Hello. I'm Randy Baim, and today Rod Scott and I are going to present a paper on saving our historic building stock through the application of non-structural mitigation. This paper is uh, to present methods and techniques for reducing uh, future flood risk to buildings and lowering uh, flood damages. Some of the backgrounds and objectives on this is that our study area was located in Apalachicola, Florida, which is a uh, coastal community and the assessment location was within the historic central business district. Now the city of Apalachicola was established in 1831 and like a lot of coastal and riverine communities throughout the country, uh, they do have a lot of flooding that occurs and most of that flooding is due to riverine, hurricane and ponding from tropical storm events. And flooding requires response and recovery efforts from federal, state, county and local government entities and the depth of flooding generally ranges from five to 11 feet. And the objectives of our study was to identify a small sampling of non-residential National Historic Register buildings and perform a flood risk assessment to determine potential non-structural mitigation techniques for reducing flood risk to those structures and with those applications, seeing if they could be uh, spread out to other buildings that also had flood risk within the community. Some of the common building stock that we deal with generally when we're conducting these are assessments from left to right are uh, structures which have a basement foundation, a slab on grade structure which has no basement or a crawl space uh, located below it, or a structure that has a crawl space foundation generally uh, located between the natural ground and the first floor elevation. And then we also look at open foundations which may consist of pilings, or open foundations which may consist of posts and columns. When we look at flood risk, it's generally defined uh, from many agencies as a function of the probability of flooding times the consequences. And the probability of flooding is the frequency of flooding or how often flooding occurs at a single specific location. And if you can reduce the frequency of flooding at that location, you can reduce flood risk. And generally, this occurs with structural projects. So let's say you have a, uh, uh, a riverine uh, community that's located right next to a, a river that has uh, occasional flooding. And those floodwaters uh, can get into the community and damage uh, structures. If you were to construct a levee and place that levee between the community and the river, you could reduce the flood damages, but you're also changing the frequency of the flooding. Now, if we consider consequences of flooding, those are the potential damages and life loss associated with flooding and the structures critical, which could be hospitals and uh, fire stations, residential structures, commercial, public and industrial. And we also consider land use, whether it's urban and rural, and these all make up the potentially damageable assets. And if we can reduce the consequences of flooding to these structures, we can also reduce flood risk. And by doing that, we have to implement non-structural projects. And what we generally look at for non-structural uh, techniques are acquisition, which requires the purchase of the building, and the building is either demolished or if it's in good condition, it can be sold and relocated outside of the floodplain. We can look at uh, relocation, which requires physically moving the existing building to a location which is completely located outside of the floodplain. We can consider elevation, which requires lifting the existing building to an elevation which is at least equal to or greater than the design flood elevation. We can consider dry flood proofing, which consists of waterproofing the building to prevent flood water from entering. And based on laboratory tests, a conventional building can generally be dry flood proof up to three to four feet in height. If you go beyond four feet, you generally should uh, have a structural engineer consider the integrity of the building walls so that there wouldn't be collapse under higher flood waters. We can also consider wet flood proofing, 
which requires that all construction materials and finishing materials be water resistant and all utilities be elevated above the design flood elevation. Now for wet flood proofing, we're allowing flood waters to come in contact with certain portions of the interior of the structure, which is completely different from dry flood proofing where we're preventing flood waters from entering the structure. And the last technique that we commonly look at is basement abandonment. And this is appropriate when basements or crawl space areas contain utilities and appliances which can be damaged by flood waters. So if you have a furnace, a uh, water heater, water softener, washer and dryer, um, uh, any appliances like that that are located in the basement, what we're looking at doing is abandoning the basement generally by placing a clean fill material and capping uh, that fill with a concrete and then constructing a utility addition uh, to be elevated above the design water surface elevation so that you could locate the appliances and utilities into that addition, which would be uh, above the de design flood elevation. Some of the typical analyses that we conduct for formulating non-structural measures when we're working within a community are hydrologic analyses where we consider the flow and duration of the flood water. We look at hydraulic considerations where we consider the depth of flooding and the velocity of flood waters. And the velocity is very important because as you see an increase in velocity of flood waters, you can see uh, an impact on the structure itself, or you can see erosion that could occur around the foundation of a structure. We also look at the uh, building inventory where we go in and uh, determine the flood risk to individual structures. And then we identify non-structural measures, which we call alternatives. And then after that, we consider developing cost estimates for each of those individual alternatives. And we're trying to seek the most cost-effective alternative for reducing flood risk to those individual structures. And then after developing the cost estimates, we'll look at a implementation plan working with uh, the city or local or state governments to see how uh, implementation can be carried out and what type of funding could be made available. When we consider uh, conducting a flood risk assessment, there's four different categories of characteristics that we want to consider. The first one is the flood characteristics where we look at the depth of flooding, the velocity of flooding, the duration of flooding, the rate of rise or how quickly those flood waters can uh, continue to rise once it, uh, a river or the coastal area starts to flood. We want to consider if there's debris or ice in those flood waters. We want to consider the wave action associated with the flood. And then we want to look at the extent of the floodplain and floodway. From that, we look at site characteristics, which is the location of where the structure is, the soil type uh, surrounding that structure. Is it permeable, impermeable? We want to look at the topography of that site. We, we also want to look at the parcel size of that site. And are we dealing with a urban or a rural site? And from there, we start to look at the individual building characteristics. We look at the construction type of that building. Is it wood? Is it metal? Is it concrete, stone? We want to look at foundation type. Is it uh, slab on grade? Is it uh, stone? Uh, brick. We want to consider the building condition. Is it in good, fair, or poor condition? If it's in poor condition, it, it, there could be some additional cost associated with implementing some of these measures. We also want to consider if there's a basement or a crawl space, and then what's the historical significance of that building? And like I said, in Apalachicola, we're dealing with a number of structures that are located on the National Historic Register. Then we also want to consider other considerations such as building occupancy, building codes, zoning and local restrictions, and is there any uh, involvement for other agencies at the local, state, or federal level. And then we want to consider community cohesion. A lot of times um, projects can divide up a community, and uh, if you go in and construct a levy in, in one portion of a community, you may be cutting off access to another portion of the community or on some uh, non-structural uh, projects. If you're uh, buying out a lot of the uh, uh, structures, you're going to end up with a checkerboard uh, pattern where you're going to have some uh, 
uh, parcels of property that are no longer of uh, economic value to that community. And then we want to consider the aesthetics of what's being implemented and if there's any public health, safety, or welfare concerns. From there, Rod can take it. All right, Randy, thanks. Um, I just got to say this was a, a great pleasure to work with Randy for this first time that we've kind of worked together. Uh, I came across the opportunity and called him and he recently retired from the Corps and so we joined forces and uh, I think the project came out very well. Uh, it was a NOAA funded uh, pilot coastal resiliency project. So I think they've got a really good pilot uh, to go around and, and look at for future grant opportunities uh, from the federal government. Um, so basically, I think a real good success story. Uh, so basically, when we evaluate and publish the evaluation, uh, we do a little bit of description about the building. Here you can see a paragraph about the, uh, the old buildings um, for each of the buildings uh, in the report. Um, this was an old cotton warehouse, one of multiple warehouses that was along the riverfront here. The community was the third largest cotton exporting port uh, prior to the Civil War, and it was built uh, around 1840s. There's only two of these old cotton warehouses that are still remain uh, standing, and, um, and both of them lost their third story on a big storm that came to town. Uh, this one opted for a kind of a slanting roof rebuild. The other one had a, a much better treatment on the rebuilding. From the storm but as you can see there's multiple openings to the building uh, kind of restricts the um, options it's a very high BFE it's right down near the water AE 12 I believe and uh, and you've got uh, two foot of freeboard so you're about eight feet for the final uh, flood proofing requirement and um, we evaluated that it just was not reasonable to expect that that building could survive uh, eight feet of dry flood proofing the entrances without uh, the walls failing. Uh, there's some condition issues in the building uh, as far as the mortar grouting between the bricks. Uh, there's a lot of damaged uh, grout joints. So um, we, we basically uh, came down to the description of the most effective mitigation project, which is elevation of the structure. Next slide, Randy. So once we got that done uh, and selected the project, then we go ahead and uh, build a scope of work. Um, in all applications for projects, you must submit a scope of work, uh, at least the federal grant funded projects. And so this helps the community understand the scope of work for this proposed project. And so we don't just give them a project, we give them a project description and how we got to that point, then the scope of work, and then next slide, Randy, we get them the actual estimates, rough project estimates based on thousands of structures that have been elevated and dry flood proofed. On the dry flood proofing projects, we actually got estimates from uh, product suppliers uh, that supply the door closures and barriers, uh, then figured in labors and, and all of the other stuff. But for the elevation here, you can see that we have a pre-designed uh, plans uh, portion of the project uh, where we do the uh, building elevations so that you can get the project approved by the uh, historic uh, review folks. Um, you've got to know your soils before you can design a set of plans and then um, uh, design construction plans we put into that early uh, pre-design pre phase. Then the post-design phase we got all the permits, uh, port of toilets, so soils, uh, site soil stabilization. That's a tongue twister, isn't it? Um, the lower four feet of the building on the interior was covered up. Uh, well, the whole interior was covered up with sheetrock and, and wood studs uh, on the inside of the brick walls. And a lot of moisture got in there. And so there's some, uh, uh, there's some missing mortar uh, in the joints of the bricks. So we planned on repointing, it's called, remortaring all of the brick joints about four or five feet up was where the damage looked like it stopped. So um, prior to its elevation, uh, prep and elevate the building, new foundation constructed, uh, relocation of all utilities, reconnection, uh, get a sewer backflow preventer, even though you're eight feet up off the ground, you, you really wanna have those backflow preventers. It really, uh, sewer water is, is the first and ugliest of the stuff that comes at you in a flood. So, um, 
And then we build stairs and ADA accessible uh, facilities. We've included an elevator in this project, in the budget. And um, then the uh, FEMA certification of dry flood proofing if we needed it. Uh, actually, in this case, it would be an elevation certificate. And so we, um, uh, next slide. And we actually redacted those numbers at the request of the community. Uh, we believe that the entire report will be uh, located on the city's website at some point, but um, currently they're going through some grants for some of these uh, flood damaged buildings from the hurricane and, um, and they elected to not have those costs revealed. Uh, so you have FEMA and HMGP uh, post-disaster and Michael uh, in that area. And we talked to them about the FEMA 406 mitigation project program. And actually two of the three, the two cotton warehouses, one is the city hall and one is the municipal museum, both on the waterfront there. Uh, both of them are involved in 406 mitigation uh, uh, grant applications right now. So we're very excited that this all happened at that point and it helped them understand the values of getting those grant programs post-disaster initiated before the deadlines to, uh, to make those applications. Uh, then you've got the HUD CDBG uh, Disaster Recovery or DR program. Uh, Florida has multiple disasters they're recovering from right now. Um, and they do allow uh, flood mitigation projects for commercial buildings under the business category, uh, funding category for their HUD money. Um, we want to encourage communities. We've seen so many disasters in the last, well, really since Sandy, that haven't really utilized enough of their opportunities for mitigating buildings other than just acquisition. Um, uh, you know, we really feel strongly that that's one time money and you've got to use it to protect your buildings into the future because what's happening is not only is the flood risk increasing, but the NFIP rates are increasing like crazy on these commercial buildings. We only have five or six years left until they're paying full actuarial rates. I've got some in the VE zone in my community that are looking at $35,000, $40,000 a year. And I don't care what business you have in there, you're just not gonna be able to uh, be able to sustain those flood insurance rates as we go forward. So take every funding opportunity you have and fix your buildings because um, this whole flood insurance increases are, are gonna be devastating on our communities. Uh, and then they, because it's historically designated or on the register, the national register, it, the building, uh, if it's a commercial building, it is eligible for the federal income tax credit program. So often this program does not make it into disaster recovery and, and mitigation incentives. And it, uh, it covers, uh, it gives you an income tax credit of up to 20% of your project costs. So if it was a $100,000 mitigation project, you would get $20,000 off your future income taxes, uh, which re remember is very important because it takes a couple of years for the community to recover from flooding. And usually the businesses want to get back online right away, but then the house homeowners are all flooded and they're not going to restaurants. And, and so there's some lag time before the income starts. And then the income starts coming back and the federal government wants it in taxes. Uh, wants your, their cut of taxes, and you can actually take those up to 15 years, those credits, uh, after the project is completed, and it's very valuable. Uh, it does take a uh, specialty um, application uh, with some unique vocabulary and style of writing that uh, is, does not mirror any of the HMGP or CDBG stuff, so you really got to find your consultant uh, cadre that, that understands these tax credits. The issue is, is very few of the tax current tax credit uh, consultants understand flood mitigation, and so there's there's um, I've done like 80 million worth of small projects, uh, which are three million and under, mostly these Main Street type projects um, of tax credits. And because I'm a CFM it, it, and a contractor, it it really made sense for me to do these applications for these building owners. So um, anyhow, that's, that's another incentive that you can actually uh, look to getting if you've got historic buildings. So Apalachicola, um, the bigger picture is really property values as these flood insurance rates and flood risk goes up. Uh, we're seeing building values starting to slip in multiple areas of the country. Uh, remember buildings 
off their values produce our tax revenues and places forced to work sales tax generation so the property tax and sales tax generation in a tourism community like this are very very important to funding the schools and the government operations and um, and it's a very dense compact little historic southern riverfront community which borders right on the gulf and so um, uh, the central business district 80 percent of it is in the special flood hazard area uh, their new maps took got a lot of work to do down there um, we think there's around 300 buildings uh, basically from a previous vulnerability study that uh, we came right afterwards and it's about 45 million in revenue and property values now you say that's pretty low and in fact Apalachicola is still relatively undeveloped unredeveloped and, and very quaint and so the building structure values aren't as inflated as in other much more popular areas uh, say the Tampa Bay region or the Miami Dade Miami Beach region where the property values are just astronomical but uh, those property and sales tax revenues are critical for communities uh, especially to pay off the revenue bonding for the infrastructure that you're going to need to do to adapt to the sea level rise as well so we got to keep those building values up and the only way to do that is to get them mitigated because the insurance is just going to kill them so go ahead next slide randy so flood mitigation projects lower flood risk and flood insurance premiums so important going forward on those pre-firm structures Flood mitigation projects will stabilize property values and tax revenues, and they create good construction trades jobs and professional engineers and architects jobs uh, for the work to get the projects to uh, completion. So um, I believe that's my last slide. Randy, is that, uh, is that the last one? Yep, last one, handed that back to you, Randy. Okay, thank you, Rod. Uh, we appreciate you listening to our session today because both Rod and I feel it's very important to reduce flood risk to uh, these buildings, particularly our historic uh, building uh, stock across the country. But if you stay with us for uh, a few moments, we're going to enter into a live question and answer period. Thank you again. Thank you, Randy and Rod. That's a really interesting presentation. Um, I think it's applicable across the whole country. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, Frank would like to know, is there a difference when it comes to CDBG DR funding, uh, whether the structure is considered commercial or non-residential? Um, to tell you the truth, Frank, I'm not a specialist in CDBG. I know that all I know is that in Florida, well, every state gets to determine how they're going to allocate their CDBG DR money. And uh, one of the classifications is for commercial, uh, which tends to believe, tend to be uh, non-residential uh, in the commercial business districts or commercial buildings, um, under my understanding and experience. So uh, you'd probably have to find a deeper qualification and determination of those terms. But my understanding is it's, it's the commercial buildings um, which have businesses in them. Now, that's not to say that um, Airbnbs and VRBOs and those are income producing buildings and they've got a, a commercial slash residential zoning because sometimes you can have that zoning that mixes in the uh, residential commercial areas um, as opposed to a pure commercial district. So uh, I'd, I'd ask you to determine it more exactly uh, according to each of the states uh, action plans for their CDBGDR. Very good, thank you. And Randy, Terry Z is asking you, uh, where might people find references, resources, and templates for non-structural flood risk mitigation? Yeah, thanks, Joyce. I, I'd like to say, Terry, just uh, direct that uh, to myself and Rod Scott, and we'll set you up. But uh, uh, actually, what we've done through our careers is followed uh, a lot of what's uh, been developed within the Corps of Engineers and then uh, FEMA technical bulletins and uh, a lot of good information out there. The Corps of Engineers has a uh, uh, non-structural um, committee itself. You can uh, 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 Google USACE uh, non-structural and you can get to some of their information. But like I say, you could reach out to myself and Rod and, and we could uh, set you up with some templates and anything that you're interested in, we could talk uh, through any of those questions with you. 
Okay, great. And the ASFPM Flood Science Center might have a few things there too. Um, so I have a question. Um, talk to us about maybe some glitchy issues that um, you might encounter with structures that are, you know, masonry or brick uh, that might be, I, I guess where I'm going is this, are there structures that cannot be elevated because of the structure itself? Yeah, I, I, uh, Rod, I'll go first on that. Uh, through our presentation, there's some of the characteristic, characteristics that we look at, Joy, uh, as far as uh, the flood characteristics, if, if the depth of flooding is too high or the velocities, that's something that we want to look at. Then we look at the uh, building itself and the condition. If uh, the condition's fair or poor instead of being good, there, there may be some concerns there. And then if we're dealing with very old structures like what Rod and I did on this Apalachicola, these are all very historic structures back to uh, the early 1800s. Uh, you really have to consider a, a structure individually. You can't just group them all together. So uh, we're pretty thorough when we go through on our assessments on looking at the outside of the structure, the interior of the structure, and then all those flood characteristics. Uh, Rod, anything you want to add? Um, yeah, uh, we go back to that wonderful uh, program earlier today, I guess it was, maybe it was yesterday, so many good programs on moving the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. Uh, 5,000 ton, 500 foot high solid brick structure with a staircase in the middle of it. Um, and they moved it 2,900 feet. And uh, on elevations, we're just talking about going vertical. We're not relocating it, which adds momentum and uh, moments and physics and stuff. But um, going up with these universal hydraulic jacking machines now, they can actually build supports around uh, like on the corners of the buildings and steel wires x on each side of the building which uh, prevents any kind of uh, motion but these elevation machines actually take these structures up vertically at a very slow rate and um, uh, there are very few buildings that cannot be elevated whether it meets the cost benefits uh, you know um, is a whole nother story but uh, you know the, i mean and there are buildings that are so rotten and and in bad condition that it would take so much money to get them just even ready to elevate. So there, again, it's a case by case basis. Both of these brick warehouse buildings are capable of being elevated eight feet in the air with a new um, AE zone, um, not in the Limwa, but back. So they don't have to have the, the pilings, but uh, a, a big solid battleship foundation. And that'll give them the two mortgage cycles or two generations until the seawater's there. and you know, my kids are going to have to figure out what to do for relocation and migration back, but uh, right. we got to get them up off the ground. They, they, they can't, nobody can stay on the ground anymore near the water, historic or not. Okay. Uh, well, Rebecca Haney asked a related question. She wants to know um, what techniques have you used to keep the look of the structure appropriate for its historic nature once it's elevated? Sure. And, and if, uh, depending on uh, uh, the height that we elevate it to uh, there's a number of things that we can do for uh, outside for landscaping that structure we definitely work with the uh, uh the shippo's office and uh, any local uh, historic district uh, officials and so forth there we've even um, looked at structures where the interior has such a high ceiling height that you know maybe it's 14 16 18 feet high we've been able to um, uh, dry flood proof the exterior of the building, but elevate uh, the interior of it so that as you come into the building uh, off the street level, you may actually be uh, taking a ramp or stairs up into a commercial uh, part of that building uh, by elevating it that way. But there, there's a number of precautions that we do. We don't want to change uh, the historic value uh, or culture of that building or anything like that. We try to maintain uh, that uh, historic uh, significance of the structure. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll take a whack at it. Um, I live in a coastal Louisiana community with no levees. Uh, we took the tail end of Cristobal this weekend, four foot of surge water over the five foot seawall. Again, a uh, 10th storm in 15 years uh, surge. We're now over 80% elevated and flood mitigated. Uh, in the beginning, it's one or two buildings those create five or six those six create 20. uh my wife the planning director it's lift them or lose them uh we are past the point of saying they have to stay on the ground because they're historic 
uh, if we don't mitigate these buildings, they will be gone. And it is an adaptation and it will be considered historic because you adapted the building and many buildings have been adapted over the years. Um, remember 1840s, they didn't have electricity and now they have electricity So, uh, and plumbing. Um, so uh, it's about evolving and adapting the historic structures. Um, we really are trying to convince communities not to take these historic exemptions because the thing we didn't talk about again today, which we should, probably should have, the actuarial rates for flood insurance on this building that we showed you, this city building, are like $25,000 a year. And we are five or six years away without NFIP 2.0, just on the ramping up that we're doing right now on NFIP, to where at actuarial risk rates. And you, you can't sell enough beers and burgers out of these old coastal buildings next to the water to pay for your flood insurance. And you can't afford to be down from flooding. So we are going to adapt. It will be considered historic. And those that don't will be left behind and lost. And it's a terrible thing to talk about. I love historic buildings, but I've got to adapt them for my kids. Yeah. Um, okay, one last question. It has to be answered really quickly. Um, do you run into any issues with dealing with indoor toxic air molds? Any advances in building materials or ways to manage those? Yeah, yeah we definitely uh, can encounter that, especially uh, if a building's been flooded a number of times and uh, yet molds start to develop. You want to you want to go in, identify that, uh, and then remediate it uh, the the best way you can. And it depends on uh, the type of mold and uh, where it's spread to on the uh, application that you do to uh, remediate it. Then. Okay. All right. Um, I think we're out of time. Um, so I want to say thank you, Randy and Rod. That was really great. And get ready to introduce the next session. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Okay, so up next is Mike Anufrachik. And if I, you know, vandalized your name, Mike, please forgive me. He's a project manager with AECOM. Uh, and his session is called A Pilot Study to Calculate Coastal Average Annualized Losses. Thank you, Mike. Resources Branch within Risk Management at FEMA Headquarters. I, along with my colleagues Mike Anna Frychek with Compass and Joel Plummer at STAR2, will be presenting some of our initial exploratory work supporting probabilistic hazard and risk assessment in the coastal space. First, I will give a programmatic over, overview of the purpose of this exploration, which is one component of an overall coastal probabilistic program, and how this fits in with a larger shift of graduated risk for FEMA. Mike and Joel will then take over to discuss the details of what we have achieved thus far in our test cases in the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts and how the calculation of averaged annualized losses is constructed. Finally, we will discuss some of the lessons learned to date. As FEMA moves into the future, the goal is to move towards a risk-informed NFIP that enhances the nation's understanding of flood risk. The mapping program has been traditionally focused on binary hazards. As we move forward, the need is there to move towards the generation of graduated hazard data that can support this goal. This shift requires partnerships with our technical partners, other federal agency partners, and state and local partners. The future of flood risk data is the initiative that we in the mapping program are working towards to drive this shift in hazard. As we make it, it's important to understand that this is not just as simple as transitioning a model framework. We need to look at the risks and hazards across frequencies and consider that flood range. The coastal probabilistic component of this initiative attempts to leverage existing coastal data to shift from binary to graduated risk, cooperate and source data from other federal agencies to support our efforts and align objectives and explore augmentation efficiencies and advances through academic partnerships. I have mentioned binary to graduated risk a couple times and, the, and here's a nice graphic that sort of describes this in the structure by structure level. Our current mapping state defines a special flood hazard area, which is aligned with the 1% annual chance condition. Structures are either in or out side of that line. As we move to our probabilistic or graduated assessments, each structure will have annualized probabilities of being impacted. 
And so with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mike to go through the details of how we constructed this initial assessment of unrealized risk in our test cases. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, my name is Mike Onafrychuk, and I am the Compass Lead for the Risk Assessment portion of CPFRA, the Coastal Probabilistic Flood Risk Assessment, um, along with my colleague Joel, who uh, will be speaking later to the sensitivity testing and tool development that we've done for this. Uh, I just wanted to kind of give a brief overview on what the basics of the CPFRA process are, um, you know, going through the different components, you know, the modeling development, uh, event scenarios, the impact estimates, um, the economic risks, and uh, the hazard development. Um, and then we'll get into kind of the testing and creation of kind of the methodology that we uh, developed during this uh, pilot study. Uh, so with the CPFRA process, the big thing that we wanted to do was uh, use existing data um, instead of going through an entire development um, of you know, new engineering. Uh, a new engineering study or having to, you know, recreate uh, information that's already out there. And so it started off with using the hydrometeorological models. Um, you know, these models that are done during, say, an FIS or a, you know, regional study go m much farther than the 1%, you know, still water uh, floodplain that you'll see on a firm map or sometimes the, you know, 0.2% uh, or 500-year floodplain. Um, and so it's using the existing data um, that was created during the, you know, JPM OS methodology uh, created for risk map um, that, you know, covers a suite of different frequencies um, and different type, uh, typology, typology events um, already created. Uh, from there, um, you know, it's the event scenario selection. Um, the numerous model events, um, you know, they reflect a much broader uh, array of different floodplains. Um, you know, like I said, not just the 1%, not just the 0.2%, but going all the way to the 10% um, for the high frequency or out to the, you know, 1,000 year for the low frequency. Um, so like the existing FIS data for the Atlantic and Gulf Coast use the JPM OS statistical model for hurricane swell assessment. Uh, and therefore have existing well-defined event scenarios um, that expand the probability space that we were able to uh, collect and use for the CPFRA process. Uh, from, the, uh, from the event scenarios, you know, we're able to uh, create the hazard exposure, um, you know, like Lauren said, uh, and the benefits of kind of a graduated approach to risk, um, you know, this is using the aggregated model scenarios. Um, so it allows a graduated view of your floodplain exposure, um, not just the in or out that we're so used to with the uh, current firm uh, maps, uh, you know, as well as the FIS study. Um, instead of just being in or out of the floodplain, you know, it gives a graduated view of what um, your risk is or exposure is from the, the hazard created during the CPFRA process. Uh, and then in the process, we get into the impact estimates. Um, this is where the actual structure information is used to determine uh, what your risk is at your specific structure location. Uh, this takes into account the still water elevations and the wave heights, as well as any structure information uh, that we may have uh, for the area of analysis. You know, this includes the number of stories, what the replacement cost value would be for, um, you know, if the house was totally destroyed, your first floor elevation or height above ground, as well as uh, any foundational type, you know, slab on grade or, um, so, you know, crawl space. Uh, and then we get to the economic risk. Uh, that's the output of CPFRA, the probabilistic flood risk assessment. Um, you know, it's an AAL, which is an average annualized loss, which um, is aggregated across all the events that we study in this, uh, you know, in this process. Um, and so that AAL gives you kind of a, you know, monetary value on what your loss would be, um, you know, based on all the risk across all the different scenarios. And so, like I said, Joel's about to talk about kind of the, the development of our process and methodology that we used for CPFRA. 
Um, but you know, once we had an idea of the process um, and the basics of CPFRA, you know, it went into the data development and tool development. Um, and like I said, the big thing was using existing data, so obtaining the digital uh, stage frequency, frequency curves, either from you know the current study or selected frequencies, and creating the best fit, um, and then developing that modular approach. Um, where we can you know, swap in and out, whether it be structural information, engineering information, existing data that um, you know, we are able to collect, and then the ability to add in new you know, hazards uh, in the future that may be needed, such as waves or erosion. Um, and so I'm going to hand it off to Joel, who's going to discuss kind of the sensitivity testing development and tool development we went through. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Hi, uh, my name is Joel Plummer and I'm a GIS developer representing STAR2. Because of the nature of the surge elevation data, the fundamental limitation of this project is that we cannot generate rasters of still water elevation data. The still water data is generated in the form of surge nodes or points, both irregularly spaced and covering a very large extent. The map to the right shows one such node data set. Each of these point data have surge elevations for 19 discrete return periods from the 10-year surge event through the 1,000-year event. To make rasters from these data would be computationally prohibitive due to the size of the data sets, the irregularly spaced points, and the number of return periods represented. Also, because of the discrete nature of the surge data, it would be very difficult to create rasters for return periods between the regular intervals provided, for example, a 25-year surge event. Another aspect of this project that was already mentioned is a modular approach. We desire the ability to be able to incorporate different uh, data sets as they become available and to be able to swap data sets in and out to see the effect each might have on the overall AAL. The core process for calculating loss is outlined in this diagram. We begin with the basic data inputs which are highlighted in red and with that information for any given surge event we can calculate or estimate the various lettered components in the diagram. Ultimately we use a depth damage function to relate the depth of flooding to a percent damage estimate and combined with the building value, replacement value we produce an estimate of loss in dollars. We can then apply this relatively simple framework in a Monte Carlo simulation using n number of randomly generated surge events per building and then iterate through every building in the data set. With a set of event frequencies and their associated loss values, we can calculate average annualized loss per building. The first challenge is to assign swell values from the surge nodes to each building. For example, on the map to the right, the buildings located on a spit between the ocean and a river or back bay, do these buildings acquire swell values from the ocean nodes or the back bay nodes, which in some locations could differ by a couple of feet. We explored several methods of assigning swell values to buildings and found that all explored methods worked equally as well as just using the values provided by the FIS five frequency swell surfaces. Because of this, we opted for the simplest method, which is, at each building, determine the three nearest surge nodes and adopt the average value at, it, at each return period. As mentioned, the surge data have swell values for the 10-year through 1,000-year events at 19 discrete return periods. For each building in the data set, we select the nearest nodes, average their values at each return period, and develop a flood frequency curve, such as shown here. However, 90% of the storms will happen at or below the 10-year event, for which there are no surge data from the nodes. In order to include high-frequency surge data in the AL calculations, we extrapolated the given frequency data out to the one-year event using log regression. We acknowledge that this can be problematic and we are currently investigating alternative methods for estimating high-frequency surge. This best fit line also allows us to determine swell heights for return periods that are between the discrete intervals, for example, the 25-year event, or even the 16.3-year event, should that be desired. An important issue that is unique to coastal hazards is that we must take into consideration the presence of waves. In the coastal environment, the base flood elevation includes the height of waves in addition to the still water elevations. 
Because the search data only represent the swells at each return period, we need to add wave, add wave heights on top of these surfaces. The depth limited equation provides us with a very basic mechanism to estimate wave height. Breaking wave height is a proportion of the still water depth. The standard value of the coefficient in this equation, 0 0.78, is better for open water scenarios and is not well suited for overland flooding due to the presence of obstructions such as buildings and vegetation which attenuate wave action. Because of this, the use of the depth limited equation as is tends to overestimate wave heights where obstructions exist. We tested two methods that are based on the depth limited method that attempt to correct this overestimate in slightly different ways, the tuned depth limited approach and the ratio method. Both methods produce similar output, each with their own small set of pros and cons. The study has moved forward relying on the ratio method to estimate wave height due to its simple inputs and ability to automate. Finally, another important factor is the development of depth damage curves. How do we translate a flood depth, including waves, to building damage? HASIS provides a large selection of possible depth damage functions but many of those functions don't provide the specificity of structure type or coastal flood condition that we want to capture or were developed independently without an underlying consistency with other curves. Because of this, we felt a strong need to develop a more coherent or self-consistent DDF suite that is appropriate for coastal and overland wave conditions for a variety of single-family residential structure types. In this plot, we show a sample of the 32 depth damage curves that were developed. These particular curves were developed for one-story single-family homes with varying foundation types and wave conditions. As mentioned, we applied the loss calculation framework in a Monte Carlo simulation. We run each building against a probabilistic suite of storms of size n in order to calculate average annualized loss. Traditionally, the number of Monte Carlo simulations is 10,000, but if we can lower n, we would gain a significant time savings. By setting n to 10,000, the existing script can evaluate one building per second. A relatively small coastal county with about 18,000 single-family homes would take approximately five hours to run. If we can reduce the number of simulations down to 300, for example, we can run that same county four times in the amount of time it takes to make this presentation. So clearly, there's an incentive to lower the value of n. We ran several tests, an example of which is shown at right, where we varied the value of n, ran the simulations, and aggregate, aggregated the annualized building losses to the community level. We found that 10,000 simulations were not necessary as AL was extremely stable for all values of n. And for n greater than or equal to 300, all values were within 1% of the mean. We adopted a value of n equals 300 for this study framework. With all the various pieces in place, we have begun a systematic test of the different aspects of coastal data that contribute to average annualized loss. We want to emphasize that this loss is strictly in the context of storm surge and overland wave conditions only. In the future, we can expand the scope of loss to include other processes, but for now, we are only looking at loss from surge and wave conditions. This diagram outlines a process for systematic testing. We have a separate team that is conducting all the PDF-CDF testing on the surge data, and we've undergone testing to see how AL is affected by the selection of frequencies in the storm suite. For example, the use of, discrete, of a discrete set of storms versus a probabilistic set, the influence of the value of Monte Carlo N on the output, capping the lower bounds of frequencies at the 10-year event instead of the 1-year event, or the upper bounds of frequencies at the 500-year event instead of the 1,000-year event. We have similarly tested two different wave estimation techniques against no-wave scenarios, and we have tested our new DDF suite versus the HAZA suite of depth damage functions to look for key differences. And we also have various building data sets. We plan to test to see how AEL changes with each data set and perhaps gain a better understanding of the influence of various building attributes, such as foundation types, on AEL. And lastly, especially with respect to testing the different factors that contribute to AL, we want to highlight the benefit of modular inputs. We designed each input dataset to plug into the script 
and to be easily replaced by another data set. If new data sets, such as buildings, waves, DDFs, etc., become available, we can slide them in to test their effect. When we do swap data sets in and out, we do have to make sure that we are consistent with vertical datum and units and that table field names match, but other than that, it's a very contained and simple process. This modularity allows us to be both flexible and efficient throughout the entire process. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. You know, as discussed, one of the big benefits of the CPFRA process um, and overall probabilistic flood risk assessment is just the vast amount of data that we're able to mine and use um, from uh, the entire uh, methodology, whether it be the engineering or structure or output um, data. Uh, one, of the, one of the big products that we found useful is uh, developing flood risk profiles. Um, and so because our analysis covers uh, a wider and more complete range of flood scenarios, uh, we're able to get a complete flood risk profile without interpolating or ex, uh, extrapolating uh, engineering information or risk information based on um, assumptions, which we would have to do if we were using the standard five FEMA uh, frequencies used in an FIS study. Uh, and so this allows us to plot out uh, the different damages at different frequencies um, you know, and eventually create a flood risk profile, and then everything that falls under that uh, line is how we compute the AAL, or what your average annualized loss is. Um, additionally, uh, there's also flood elevation probability curves, uh, which are similar to the flood risk profile. Um, one of the outputs would be uh, individual event damage scenarios, which come from uh, still water and uh, wave uh, events uh, and we would be able to extract each individual event um, to kind of create a uh, structure level risk uh, swell. So this will allow us to determine at each frequency what the elevation of the still water, uh, the still water elevation would be um, at the 1%, at the 10%, um, at high, lower frequencies such as the you know, 0.2%. Um, and it, it gives you a visual tool to use to um, you know, see what an individual structure uh, risk is over the entire suite of events. Uh, additionally, um, the creation of different uh, maps and uh, you know, like the hotspot map for AAL showing where you would expect the most damage uh, compared to least damage uh, using the data outputs. Uh, you know, so different heat maps and products to use for uh, communication efforts and outreach efforts. Um, you know, it allows us to sh communicate risk in a way that's just not in or out. Uh, you, you know, it's the whole graduated risk uh, that uh, we're trying to convey to whether it be the, you know, local official or, uh, you know, homeowner of uh, what the risk is at that specific uh, structure, uh, structure level. So finally, I mean, like we've talked about, some of the benefits from uh, CPFRA is it just gives you that full risk profile, um, you know, from the high to the very low frequencies. Um, you know, it's that movement to graduated risk from binary. Um, it's not in or out. Uh, it allows you to see the uh, data in terms of damages, not, you know, zone AE, zone V, zone VE. Um, no, and it, it provides you know, high resolution data for each return period that's done in the analysis. So that can be extracted kind of from the uh, back end database. Uh, if there's a specific scenario that needs further investigation uh, or you know, lining up against what the you know, 50 year storm would be. Um, and this data is, you know, can be used for different abilities like benefit cost analysis, you know, mitigation projects and funding. Um, enhanced outreach and awareness for you know public meetings, um, so communities and individuals have a better idea of what the risk is. And finally, um, just some of the lessons that we've learned from you know this entire pilot study. Um, you know, one, this is an ongoing process. Uh, there's much more testing that needs to be done. Um, so, uh, like Joel mentioned, this is a modular. Uh, a modular method methodology where we plan on making additional changes and testing um, to see what uh, the outputs, how they change with different, you know, data sets or, you know, number of frequencies, et cetera. 
Um, but there, there's really a small difference. The first one is a small difference between the number of simulations, like Joel mentioned, between 10,000 and 300. Uh, there was not that big of a difference in terms of um, final output at the community level. Uh, and not surprising to anyone that you know is fam familiar with this space, uh, the, the high frequency events, you know, the 10 year um, to the two year, they are the drivers of what the final AAL or average annualized loss will be. Um, that is an area where there definitely needs to be further um, ex exploration and testing um, uh, in terms of developing a good methodology to make sure that we have accurate information there because uh, you know getting into those high frequ frequency events will really drive up the average annualized loss uh, and you know the point is to you know communicate uh, you know as an accurate as a uh, you know, output that we can for uh, AAL. Uh, and finally, you know, one of, one of the other uh, aspects that we incorporated was the waves analysis, and that also dramatically increases the AAL over the uh, still water elevations. Um, and so, you know, it's up to 30%, and it provides uh, the potential to utilize and uh, implement wave data in this modular scheme that may provide a different result than the simplified scaling that's been done before. Um, so, yeah, we look forward to continuing this uh, pilot project for uh, CPFRA uh, and sharing, you know, additional information in the future. Um, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Um, I need to do a follow-up introduction of a sort to let you know who else was speaking there. Uh, in addition to Mike uh, on you, Frychuk, uh, from AECOM Compass is uh, Joel Plummer from Dewberry Star 2 and Lauren Schmid from FEMA HQ. So thank you to all three of you. Um, very interesting presentation. We do have a few questions. Uh, so number one is, how do you deal with nodes at the edge that don't get wet at every return period? Those that are above the 0.2%, for example, but would get inundated by more severe storms. Well, the first thing we do is we look at the nodes and we filter out any node that doesn't have values at all. So we can get rid of those. But then, yes, you're correct. You will find nodes that do have values for the low frequency returns, such as the 500, 600 year return period, but don't have any for the 10, 20, 30, the high frequency return periods. And so when we encounter those, that initiates a second search in which we go and find perhaps the next closest, closest node that does have a value that will satisfy that return period. So it's a bit of a, a two-step process, um, and it's a little more complicated than what I'm, I'm, I'm saying, but that's really the simplest way to, to answer that question. Okay, thank you. Um, and Guillermo asks, how do you deal with areas that have both riverine and coastal floods? So, uh, right now, we are currently only, only dealing with um, areas affected by coastal flooding. Um, there's a separate initiative um, with FEMA uh, that is, might have been discussed in other presentations uh, during at ASFPM um, that is dealing with rivering flooding and the effects um, and the you know average annualized losses that come from those. Uh, probabilistic scenarios. Uh, you know, the hope is, you know, at some point to kind of combine the two initiatives to uh, better determine areas that, or structures that are both affected by coastal and riverine. Uh, but right now, the focus on this pilot is only uh, using uh, coastal engineering data for uh, evaluating a AALs. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the next question, is the most challenging time-sensitive portion of this analysis getting the construction details of each structure input in the model? I would say no right now. Um, during the pilot, this kind of pilot study, um, we are using, whether it be, you know, provided structure data from, you know, a third party or local uh, you know, local community structure information. Um, so for the most part, it has been filled out. Um, the, you know, whether it be first floor elevation or, 
a uh, number of stories or building value um, for this study it's, it's been for, provided for us um, you know obvi obviously you know that's a whole another question about how to get better you know a better national structured data set um, but in terms of you know the evaluation of structure specific information um, it, you know it's been thoroughly completed for uh, the project that we're trying to do Okay, and I have to say the rest of all the comments are just accolades for the presentation. Um, and so we thank you again uh, for being a part of the, um, the conference this year. So up next is Russell Jackson. Uh, he is a coastal hazard specialist with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. And his presentation is titled, Facilitating Resilience building actions in coastal communities. Russell? My presentation on resources to facilitate resilience building actions in coastal communities. I'm Russell Jackson, a coastal hazard specialist with the NOAA Office for Coastal Management. Today I'll be presenting a range of tools and resources to help you visualize your flood hazards and implement solutions to reduce those impacts using green infrastructure. Our resources are primarily geared towards coastal areas including the Great Lakes, but some of them can also be used in inland areas as well. I'm going to start off by providing some background on NOAA's Office for Coastal Management and let you know what I'll be sharing with you today. At NOAA's Office for Coastal Management, we're working to help coastal communities reduce impacts from extreme coastal storms, like you see here, also climate change, particularly sea level rise and increased precipitation, by helping folks first visualize where these hazards might occur. I'll be introducing you to some of our resources to help you with this. Everything I'll be showing today can be found on our Digital Coast website, so I'll give you a little background on that. The website is basically a platform of data, tools, and training, all based on audiences' needs around coastal resource management. <clears throat> approach is really to bring the geospatial and coastal management communities together. And the outcome was a constituent-driven, integrated, enabling platform supported coastal resource management that is actually used. The Digital Coast is not just a NOAA website. We have built the content with a number of NGOs, that you see here. Since 2006, this group of NGOs representing well over 100,000 members have been working with us at NOAA to shape the vision and content of the Digital Coast. These organizations offer a, a diversity of perspectives and requirements for information to meet their members' needs. Their members include planners, floodplain managers, county officials, conservationists, real estate developers, and GIS specialists. So the partnership has worked hard to provide information through the Digital Coast to help meet the needs of these folks and hopefully make their jobs easier. <clears throat> In addition to the Digital Coast partners, there are numerous other organizations that contribute data, tools, training, and other resources to the Digital Coast. Many of the organizations that have been had a strong presence here at the ASFPM conference are among those contributors. As you can see, the Digital Coast has a lot to offer, over 80 terabytes of data, over 190 learning resources, and over 50 tools. <clears throat> so, during the presentation, I'll be talking about visualizing coastal hazards and climate change impacts to both the natural and built environment using the Coastal Flood Exposure Mapper. I'll also tell you about our nature-based solutions for coastal hazards training and some of our green infrastructure resources. And then to wrap up, I'll talk about conserving open space as a green infrastructure strategy to reduce flooding and gain credit through FEMA's community rating system. I will walk you through the how-to resource to help you map open space for this purpose. This is the homepage of the Digital Coast. You'll note at the bottom right that we have our top five most popular resources on the Digital Coast listed. And listed at number five is the Coastal Flood Exposure Mapper. You can, you can access the tool from this link. Click the link for tools or search at the top. Once you click the link, you're taken to the launch page for the mapper. Here you'll find more information about the tool, some of its key features, a very brief, less than three minute video tutorial, 
as well as other resources such as stories from the field which allow you to access information about how others have used the tool. The stories in the field are very brief and designed to be printed on one, a one page and focus really on the issue, process, and outcome of using the mapper. From this page we can launch the actual mapper by clicking the green launch button at the bottom right. <clears throat> we'll then be taken to the mapper splash page. Before getting started I wanted to point out that the splash page contains a brief summary of the purpose of the mapper. The purpose is really to help start community discussions about hazard impacts with maps of your area that show people, places, and natural resources exposed to coastal flooding. It's not for conducting detailed vulnerability assessments, but more about using national level data sets to start the conversation about coastal flood risk in your community. <clears throat> now, we can click the green Get Started button and interact and create maps. The mapper contains data for the East, West, and Gulf Coasts, as well as Pacific and Caribbean islands and territories. This is what the mapper looks like when you first enter. I will now give you a quick tour of the mapper and some of its functionality by exploring the four corners of the tool. First, on the top left, you'll note the NOAA logo. This can be used to navigate back to the digital coast at any time. In addition, it is also important to note that beside the logo, you'll see what data layers are currently being displayed. The default when you first launch the application is the Coastal Flood Hazard Composite layer. More on that in a minute. <clears throat> to the right, you'll note that there is a search function that will allow you to quickly zoom to a location. Since I live in Charleston, South Carolina, I chose to zoom into this location. I will zoom in a little further just to focus a little bit on the historic downtown peninsula. If you have ever visited Charleston, you're probably more familiar with that area. <clears throat> and this area has significant flooding issues. Next, I wanted to point out some of the functionality at the bottom right of the mapper. First, if you click on the question mark button, you can find out more details about the mapper. From here, you get uh, some basic info about the mapper. You also get our disclaimer. You can also access some additional resources. Let me zoom into those additional resources and highlight a few. Under the additional resources, you can access our frequently asked questions section. You can also find some tips for how to use these maps. One of the more popular resources is the data sources section. This contains info on all of the data used in the mapper and links to the authoritative sources for those data. If you are very GIS savvy and want to interact with the data with your own local data sets, you can access the map services here. Back to the mapper, another key feature on the bottom right is the ability to share a map. <clears throat> if you want someone to see the same thing you're looking at, or you're in a virtual meeting, which we're in a lot of these these days, and wanted everyone in the meeting to be looking at the exact same map, you can click the share button and a unique URL will be generated for you to share through email, text, or some other method. You can also change the base map for the image. In addition to changing the base map, you have the ability to turn on and off the roads layer, which can be a useful reference. Uh, the other key feature at the bottom right is the ability to turn the legend on and off. <clears throat> now, let's shift to the bottom left of the mapper. From here, you can access the Layers panel and interact with all of the data layers in the mapper. With the Layers panel expanded, you will note that the Coastal Flood Hazard Composite is active. I will now quickly show you some of the functionality associated with creating and saving maps. But before I do, in the interest of time, I won't be able to discuss all of the layers in detail. This diagram shows you all of the flood hazard layers that are available. It also shows you the societal, infrastructure, and ecosystem layers available to visually assess exposure to each of those flood hazards. <clears throat> now getting back to some of the functionality associated with the data, data layers. I have highlighted how you can turn a layer on and off with the slider. You can also click the eye icon to access more information about that layer. So once I select the eye icon, I can find out more about the hazards layer. For example, this tells you that the coastal flood hazard composite is made up of components of, other, of all of the other hazard layers and that the darker the color on the map, 
the more flood hazard zones there are for that location. The coastal flood hazard composite is based on some mapping we did working with the state of New York to help them during the Hurricane Sandy recovery. They were interested in addressing more than just storm surge when they were making decisions about rebuilding. We'll You'll note that this layer doesn't have all of the hurricane categories, but only categories one through three. If an area is going to be inundated by a category one storm, it will also be inundated by a category two, three, four, and five. We chose to limit the composite layer to show the areas that are likely to be inundated more often and to alleviate having way too many layers, especially since storm surge has five layers and sea level rise has 10 layers in, in one foot increments from 1 to 10. It's also important to note that the coastal composite flood hazard layer is the only hazard layer that you can click on the map to identify which hazards exist in that location. <clears throat> Here we see that this location is susceptible to eight different flood hazards, including FEMA flood zones, high tide flooding, sea level rise, and storm surge. Now I want to point out one of the coolest features of the mapper. If you like a certain map and may want to reference it again or share it with others, you can easily do so. The Save Map function allows us to do that. The Save Map function at the bottom of the layers list can be used to save that map. And you'll note after clicking that, um, that the number of saved maps went from 0 to 1. This is like your shopping cart on Amazon, and you feel free to just fill that card up with maps. I will quickly show you how easy it is to switch between hazard layers. This is the high tide flooding layer. If I select the eye icon beside the layer name before, like before, I will now get information about this layer. You will note that in some cases, we also have other useful links and informational videos in this section. <clears throat> this is an animation containing useful information to help explain tidal flooding and its impacts. There are also videos associated with hurricane storm surge and tsunami layers. I like this map too, so I will save it and start building up a collection of maps. This is the FEMA flood zones layer for the area. You will note that if I try to display the tsunami inundation layers for this area, I get this crosshatching indicating that this area hasn't been mapped. This is the storm surge section. One of the additional functionality associated with this layer is the ability to display the flooding associated with each individual hurricane category from 1 to 5. By using the slider at the bottom of the map, for example, we, we are currently looking at Category 1 hurricane. If I were to slide to Category 3, we start to see almost all of the peninsula inundated. Now with the Category 5, all of the peninsula is inundated. We also have that same similar slider bar functionality for our sea level rise layer. We can slide between 0 and 10 feet of sea level rise. <clears throat> Much of Charleston Peninsula were wetlands that were filled in for development hundreds of years ago. With 3 feet of sea level rise, we start to see some of the former creeks and wetlands start to flood. <clears throat> With 10 feet of sea level rise, almost all of the peninsula will be inundated. One of the key features of the mapper is the ability to visually assess exposure of various societal infrastructure and ecosystem layers to each of the flood hazards. This is the population density of Charleston. This population density of Charleston combined with the FEMA flood layers. It's a little difficult to see what is below the hazard layer, so we can easily adjust the opacity of any of the layers by selecting the half black, half white circle beside the layer. Once selected, a slider bar opens below the layer that allows you to adjust the opacity. I want to also point out the critical facilities data set within the infrastructure exposure layers. You'll note that I also changed the base map to the dark theme so the icons kind of stand out a little better. <clears throat> Let's merge them with the hurricane storm surge zones to help assess their exposure. This type of analysis can be very valuable for emergency managers and the Red Cross. Typically, schools are used as hurricane evacuation shelters, but the Red Cross who manages the shelters has a policy of not locating any shelter within a Category 4 inundation area. I'm only showing the Category 3, but you can easily tell that no Red Cross shelters can be located on the peninsula. Another key functionality of the critical facilities layer 
is the ability to click on any of the icons to identify more information about that facility, such as the name and type facility. To identify features also available for potential pollution sources layer within the ecosystem exposure section. In addition to the facility name and type, it also includes a link to the EPA website with more detailed information about each location. <clears throat> Getting back to the shopping cart or save maps functionality, once you have all of your maps created and saved, you can interact with them by switching from the active layer to the saved maps at, at the top. You'll note that we have seven saved maps lift, listed. Once in the saved maps tab, you have several ways to interact with your and share those saved maps. <clears throat> A thumbnail of each map is displayed along with some functionality for each saved map. I want to now highlight some of that functionality for you. The first icon allows you to export the map as an image file. And you have a few options available. Many of our users have used the maps in reports and PowerPoint presentations. So we give you the ability to export the map, just the map, export the map with the title, and export the legend. You can also share the unique URL that is created when you saved your map. The URL will last forever, even if you close out your browser. All of the maps you save will remain in your saved maps collection, even after you close your browser, unless you clear your cache. But even if you clear your cache, you can still access the map with that saved URL. <clears throat> you can also share the entire collection of maps, like all seven in our case, by using the Share Collection button at the bottom. When you hit the Share Collection button, a window opens allowing you to download all of the URLs and titles as a text file or to copy them all, including the thumbnail image to your clipboard so you can paste them into an email or some other file such as a Word document. You can also delete the entire collection of saved maps with the trash can at the bottom or you can delete any individual saved map using the trash can under each of its titles individual titles. <clears throat> oh, we no longer have any saved maps, so maybe it's time to move on. <clears throat> so I'm going to shift gears and now talk briefly about some of our green or natural infrastructure resources. We're also helping communities use green infrastructure as a strategy to reduce risk associated with storms and sea level rise, as well as protect the health of coastal waters and ecosystems that provide so many benefits to communities. I'll be highlighting some of the uh, several resources that help with green infrastructure planning and implementation. All of the resources I'll be covering today can be found on our Digital Coast website and specifically on our Natural Infrastructure Topics page. The page provides training, tools, publications, and guidance relevant to, to natural infrastructure. Along the lines of getting people together to talk about coastal flooding concerns and solutions using maps, we also like to help people dig in a bit further on potential green infrastructure solutions and how they can be implemented in their communities. To do, to do this, we developed a new training called Nature-Based Solutions for Coastal Hazards. The, con the course consists of two parts. Part one is really focused on the basics. It's a self-guided online module that covers foundational concepts prior to attending the in-person event. Those basics talk about coastal hazards, ecosystem services that can reduce impacts, GI practices that can provide services. And then part two is really focused on developing a strategy. And it's, it's an in-person, one-day event where participants interact with, uh, with their peers and local experts to develop a green infrastructure, imp, green or natural infrastructure strategy that considers Hazard reduction benefits, co-benefits, design, maintenance, costs, and implementation through partnerships, funding, and policy. During our trainings and through our other interactions with coastal planners and managers, we always hear about great green infrastructure projects. And when we do, we love to interview people working on them and share their projects and lessons learned with others. You can find these peer-to-peer -peer case studies on the Digital Coast Academy. We have case studies on a range of green infrastructure practices and locations. These are, all, these are just a few examples on this slide. We have a case study on rain gardens being used for community outreach in American Samoa. We have one in Florida on how they're combining multiple scale practices to address flooding impacts, including land conservation, 
stormwater management practices throughout the community on a larger scale, but also working with homeowners to do small things on their properties. Another resource I wanted to show you is called the Green Infrastructure Effectiveness Database. We've been hearing from our coastal managers and planners that not only do they need to hear about how people are implementing green infrastructure on the ground, they also needed to have access to literature on the effectiveness of green infrastructure practices and reducing hazard impacts so that they can justify their work and learn from others and find out what's going on with research. Once you launch the database from the Digital Coast, you get a simple search page that you see here. You can just type what you're looking for in the simple search function here, or you can click on the advanced search drop-down, which brings you to this page. It allows you to filter and narrow using region, scale, hazards of interest, such as flooding, wave action, and erosion, and by green infrastructure types. There are, over, there are 32 different green infrastructure types to choose from. So I'm going to conduct a search for effectiveness of bioretention and reducing flooding from precipitation and stormwater. You notice on the left there at the top it says there's 19 resources that have been returned. And if I click on a resource, I get a link to the actual literature source in addition to a description of key findings and additional information that can be really helpful before you start to really uh, diving into that source. We're all busy professionals, so hopefully this can help you um, find what you're looking for and save a little time. The specific literature you're looking at on the screen, for example, found that rain gardens and other bioretention practices can reduce stormwater runoff decrease, combined sewer overflow, overflows, and save municipalities money. In this study, 28 rain gardens were installed in intersections in the combined storm sewer area in Aurora, Illinois. By installing rain gardens instead of constructing gray infrastructure, to manage their stormwater, they saved an estimated of 1.8 million in 2013. Conserving open space is one of the tools a community can use to help reduce impacts from flooding. A key goal of our office is to help communities increase their resilience to coastal hazards like flooding using GI solutions. And we are always interested in how we can support communities interested in obtaining FEMA CRS credits for their green infrastructure projects. To help meet this need, we developed a training resource called How to Map Open Space for Community Rating System Credit. The how-to focuses on CRS Activity 420, Open Space Preservation, which provides up to 1,450 points for parcels in a regulated floodplain that are permanently preserved as open space. Under this activity, a community may qualify for additional credits for parcels as shown here. It's also important to note that these are maximum number of points that can be earned, and not all communities will earn that. This is what the how-to looks like. The navigation bar on the left side of the page, a light blue, allows users to scroll through the seven steps. Each step includes sub-steps with brief explanations and drop-down boxes with more guidance. One of the useful aspects of the how-to is that it combines information from the CRS user manual into one place for ease of reference. There are two main components to the how-to. One is a step-by-step -step process that describes how to ca calculate open space credits for existing preserved lands and lands that may be considered for future protection. The target audience for this instructional piece are municipal and county planners involved in land use planning and floodplain management, including the community CRS coordinators. The other part is a GIS workflow and mapping guide, which provides step-by-step -step GIS instructions for mapping open space within the regulated floodplain and is for GIS spatial analysts. By working through the GIS workflow and mapping guide, an analyst is able to create a GIS layer and map document showing all parcels that may qualify for open space preservation credit within their community, special flood hazard area for submission to FEMA. We created both the instructional component and the GIS workflow to help CRS coordinator and GIS analysts work together. There are several job aids included in the how-to that can help ease preparation for a community CRS verification visit. These include an Excel spreadsheet template that can be used to calculate potential open space credit for individual parcels, a data checklist 
which lists potential sources of information with links where available to help identify and document open space preservation credits. And a quick shameless plug for one of the data sets that can help identify open space is NOAA's Coastal Change Analysis Program, or CCAP land cover data set that's available on the digital coast. A checklist for screening potentially qualifying parcels and checking sources of documentation as you go. And also a Word document template for filling out the information needed to document a property's credit for natural functions open space. This was, wasn't a lone effort. The Nature Conservancy, Coastal States Organization, ASFPM, and NOAA through the Digital Coast Partnership worked together to develop a CRS strategy led by the TNC to ensure that each organization's respective CRS products are complementary and aren't duplicating efforts. TNC was instrumental instrumental in helping us with the how-to GIS workflow methodology. We also work together to build capacity in using various tools and provide technical assistance. And with that, that's all I have and we can take questions. Thank you so much, Russell, for that uh, overview of green infrastructure resources. Um, and for taking us to the end of our day today. I know that's a, kind of a special spot on any day for a conference like this. Uh, we do have a question from Mary Carson Stiff, um, and she asked, does the green infrastructure database include specific design plans for a green infrastructure practice that someone could follow and expect to get somewhat of a similar return of the same benefits? She's wondering about the level of the details for the examples. Um. I have to be honest, I'm not familiar with all of the, the resources in the database. I was just actually, um, I'm, I'm more familiar with the Coastal Flood Exposure Map where I oversee that project. I'm, I'm a little familiar with the database, but not a lot of the resources in there. And, and it does, but the ones I do know, it does vary quite a bit. You know, some of them have pretty, or the, the studies themselves may document pretty well. They're not, in, in most cases, they're not gonna have like design level plans um, referenced in, in the resources, but they do have really good links and to more information and people to contact to find out, you know, more specific details on, on how you would design it specifically if you're trying to meet a specific need and, and maybe try to, to, to develop a very similar project in your area. Okay, that's fair. Uh, and another question, uh, a couple questions have come in. Let's see. Um, Cooper wants to know what was that land cover data set you mentioned again? Okay, the, the land cover data set, our, our office has a, a program called the Coastal Change Analysis Program where they have gone in and they, um, using satellite imagery for, for years, um, for a couple of decades now, have been going in and, and creating a land cover data set for the coastal areas. And, um, and then based on that, we're able to do a change analysis by looking at how things have changed every say every 10 years or so so we have what's called the coastal change analysis program but we also it, more recently we've been using higher resolution data um, with some of the land cover data so some of the areas are starting to get higher resolution you know it's a national level data set so it's not the, the highest resolution data but it's it's pretty useful um, our gi uh, open space gis mapping um, how to guide that we have mentions how you can use that land cover data set at, at the scale that it is just to help you um, start to narrow in on potential areas for uh, preserving open space. But hopefully you, you can get higher resolution data once you zoom in a little bit, you can use some local data and, and verify it and actually get it more specific. Okay, and Mark wants to know, will the mapper look to add non-water related hazards such as earthquake or wildfire, or is that beyond the intended scope? No, it's, it's actually beyond the intent and scope of, of the mapper. We're, we, we're keeping it specific to flooding, um, coastal flooding and the various types of flooding, just so it doesn't get so overwhelming. There's a lot of, um, you know, other tools out there that do multi-hazards and, and others, and, and sometimes it can get confusing, but we wanted to really focus in on an issue that a lot of our constituents are, have, are dealing with, and it's, it's the coastal flooding specifically. So that's why the mapper really focuses just on that. And one thing I'll just mention right now, also the mapper, we are currently, I mentioned where the current, um, where, where it's available now, it's pretty much almost all of the coastal US except for Alaska and the Great Lakes. And we are currently expanding to the Great Lakes and hope to have that included by um, 
we have a deliverable date of, of March of this next year, but we may have it done before then. Great. Well, again, thank you, Russell, for taking us to the end of the day. And just want to remind everybody in a half an hour, if you go to the events tab of the conference website, you can click on the trivia night and uh, enjoy some networking, at least that way with your friends. So this closes our session for today. Have a great evening.